Someone had to take charge, and Rob took charge and said, Bill, you'll wear this, and Maria, you'll wear that. Maria took the Republican color. Yeah. Bill took the Democratic color. Yeah. I took independent. Yeah. Yes, she did. Yeah. Yes, she did. That's just how it played out today, and we're glad to be here. Indeed. We're not here tomorrow, and we're not here on Friday. There'll be a CBS program specially crafted for the 4th of July that will air tomorrow. We'll get about half of that in, and then it's uh, disrupted for Nationals baseball, so we'll play uh, it all over again Friday in its entirety. And then we're back Monday with uh, regular programming. Now, talking about color clothes, working on the assumption that Peretti is clothed, (laughs) what what color clothes do you think you'll have on? (laughs) <laughs> this brings me back to the shower scene. It, I, 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 was, I was sort of going back there, too. I heard that uh, commentary in person, by the way. I was At the dinner. I was at the dinner. I, but you were not in the shower. I was not in the shower, but I gave remarks on behalf of Two Star. Um, <laughs> and uh, and uh, just was sort of um, awed at the response by the audience that evening. (laughs) Joe, and and that's an interesting story because I was supposed to co-host that with you that night, but my son's surgery ended up taking the better part of the entire day. I think we were there at five or six in the morning at the hospital. I think we were supposed to be done by noon or one. I was going to try to uh, get out. My wife was going to stay the first night, but as it turned out, it just went on way too much uh <laughs> and i didn't get out of there at all by the time i got back you guys were already into the dinner and i was texting back and forth saying joe i think you're gonna have to take this one on your own so he did a joe you did a great job that evening oh, well, it was great it, it, oh, that, 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 except that for the shower you, story that, except for the shower <laughs> story yeah, that's right <laughs> that's, that's kind of you to say maria uh, uh you know the shower story uh, they the, the message behind the shower story was that, you know, Bill was accosting me for wasting water, which at, at that time, back in the, in the early to mid nineties, uh, that was a real cause for Mr. Stubblefield, uh, warning that we were you know, tapping too deeply into our, our water reservoirs underground. And, and he was correct. Of course, we went through a drought and experienced a lot of problems with that, but, uh, I, you know, the, the description I gave was just a sidelight to, to the real story. That, that Bill was a, a man of many causes, and, and that shower scene was an indication that uh, water was very important to him at the time. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not. Thanks, Joe. I'm going to let it go with that. Yeah, there, we're going to just go on now. Exactly. Uh, Joe, uh, we uh, have had a. A lot of decisions recently from the Supreme Court of the United States. It's been a busy, uh, I oh, guess, July yeah. for them. And uh, a lot of these decisions have broken on a 6-3 uh, bent. And I haven't heard the numbers for every single one of the decisions, uh, but have uh, have the majority of them come down 6-3, or has there been a, a more of a split, and have there been any of the justices whose opinions have surprised you? Well, uh, it's interesting. One of the decisions we're going to discuss this morning was a, a 6-3 decision, but not with the uh, names that we ordinarily associate with a 6-3 split. Uh, but yes, this term saw more of the conservative liberal split than we've seen in other terms. I, I believe that, that this we, we almost doubled the number of 6-3 votes that we had in the previous term. So yeah, this was... Uh, I think it's fair to say a little bit more politically charged than it has been in previous Supreme Court terms. So for the last several years, and and it goes back probably more than I care to admit on this one, and not because of age, but just because of how long I felt this way, I felt that the Supreme Court has really become just a political body as opposed to an appointed body of legal scholars who are supposed to study the Constitution and come up with an answer, it seems to me that they study the Constitution and come up to the poli- with an answer that fits their political viewpoint. And Rob, that, that makes it, to me, an elected office, Joe. Instead of yeah. being appointed for life, if, if we're going to conduct this, and, and this, believe me, this term isn't what has made me say this. I've felt this way for a good 20-something years. If, if this is the way the Supreme Court rules on things, then they should be elected. They should have to run for office by party the same as everybody else has to do it. What do you think about that? 
Well, that is the debate we're going to be having uh, uh, amongst others, including term limits uh, for the justices and how many justices need to be on the court and things of that nature. Robert, you know, we can go back into the 1930s and and Roosevelt's New Deal uh, proposals that were uh, always challenged, it seems, in front of the the U.S. Supreme Court at the time and Roosevelt's attempt to pack the court. And so politics has has been a part of the U.S. Supreme Court for quite a while. Uh, I think what's what's got people looking at the Supreme Court perhaps a little differently these days are are a couple aspects that, that... are kind of prominent in my way of thinking. Number one, uh, look, we've had candidates now running for president who has have made it a, a real political issue that uh, I've got Supreme Court appointments that I'm hoping to make, and here's how, how what the net effect of those appointments are going to be. I mean, go back to 2016 where President Trump essentially ran on overturning Roe v. Wade which, of course, we know happened two years ago in the Dobbs decision. Uh, we've also had uh, candidates for office talk about destroying or upending the regulatory state. Well, with one of the cases we're going to discuss th- this morning with the Chevron doctrine, that, in fact, did happen. So uh, the public can draw a, a clear line between the political rhetoric of campaigns and the Supreme Court decisions. And, and and then conclude that, you know, while well, politics are at work. The other thing I think that is interesting, and, and again, this is from my viewpoint, others might disagree with this, but uh, right now you can, you can go back and find where all of these justices in their confirmation hearings speak to terms like originalism and textualism. And, you know, if it's not in the Constitution, we're not going there. Uh, that sort of thing. And, uh, you know, they raised their right hand in front of Congress and talked about what their judicial philosophy. Well, in this decision uh, that we're going to talk about with in Trump versus United States, they've created an immunity out of whole cloth. There, there's no constitutional provision that supports this Supreme Court decision. So originalism and textualism seems to be hollow words. And, and so, again, the public can conclude that this is a political body uh, that is, you know, where the means justify the ends. And, and that's where I see a Supreme Court whose reputation is taking a, a little bit of a hit right now. I mean, we've been there before, as we've talked about, but it, it's right now it's not hard to draw that line between the politics and what the Supreme Court is ultimately doing uh, in some of these decisions. So, Joe, do you blame that, not blame, that's not a good word, but it, because they are more under the microscope, if you will, is the media covering things a little bit differently now? Um, we could get into a whole discussion about that. But but how do you um, attribute that um, in, today's, um, in today's environment? Well, I, I think you're right, Maria, and... and- talking about today's environment, which is, you know, politics has become more or less a football game where the ball is kicked back and forth and whose team is winning and what's the score. And the media plays that up because it's, you know, sensationalism for for their ratings. Uh, It's how they cover the news these days. And, you know, they've got reporters hanging outside in front of the Supreme Court and breathlessly saying, here's the new decision and who's here's who wins and loses. And, uh, sometimes the nuances of some of these Supreme Court decisions are lost uh, in that, uh, and it's a mischaracterization that you know one side has prevailed and the other has not. Uh, sometimes you really have to dig deep in some of these Supreme Court decisions to figure out the, exactly what's being decided. And and you know I, I believe there's been a little bit of hyperbolic reaction to the uh, Trump immunity case uh, on the left. Um, yeah, there's some concerns that uh, are, are legitimate, but there's also uh, some things that, you know, saying that, you know, the president's suddenly going to start ordering assassination squads uh, and things of that nature seems to be a little bit over the top. But that's, you know, the, that serves the media interest, which is to drive those ratings. So uh, I, I think the media has, in some respects, and the way we cover the Supreme Court, it's both uh, – supported the notion of the Supreme Court acting as a political body, but also 
has uh, perhaps gone over the top and to serve their own interests in driving viewership. Joe, every year there's been uh, some criticism of the Supreme Court when the decisions have come out. This year, though, there's been four or five decisions that I think have gotten a lot of press. The immunity, the Chevron, the Purdue Pharmacy, the oversight of social media, uh, and the abortion drug and the like. Of these, do you think one or two are going to have far-reaching impact more so than the others? I think the two cases which I, I, I have fundamentally changed uh, both the, the, the uh, role of federal government in the Chevron case and fundamentally changed the branch of government in terms of immunities now granted to the person sitting uh, in the Oval Office, I think those will have far-reaching effects. I wonder how long these decisions will be upheld because in both cases they invite a lot of problems that one can easily foresee in the chevron doctrine case uh it, it's it's you know if you're against federal regulation and of course we <laughs> many people are because we know that the, the feds oftentimes are guilty of overreach but if you look at the alternatives how are we going to resolve many of the issues that come up in federal regulation? Now, I'll give you one example. We just learned last week that pasteurizing cow's milk at 161 degrees for 15 seconds kills bird flu. So that the risk of spreading bird flu through animal products or byproducts uh, can be lessened if we undergo that process. Now, do you think Congress and the courts are going to have the nimbleness to sit down and say, okay, this is a new regulation that we have to have now. Cow's milk has to be pasteurized at that temperature for that length of time. Uh, we know the federal regulators can do that. They have the scientists and they, uh, they have the background to uh, institute such rules. But can we rely on Congress and the courts to do that or have the oversight necessary to make sure that, the, in that case, the FDA is not overreaching? On, on a product like milk, uh, it's those kinds of specifics that you'll wonder if we ha are going to have the ability to do the regulations necessary to protect the health of, of society going forward. And so I, I think that the, the lack of Chevron deference now that the court has deemed appropriate is, is going to be a workable solution uh, down the road. And, and you can see the same thing with presidential immunity and all the things that we can get into there. So I think those two decisions, Bill, are going to be the most impactful. And I wonder if they're going to stand the test of time. Yeah. And I agree with you uh, with those two. I especially agree with Chevron. What has happened is they're shifting the the logic from a scientific basis to a uh, a non-scientific basis, either in the court system, which are rarely made up of professional, scientific professionals, or or Congress, which uh, has uh, talents, but they're not scientific. All the agencies through time have assembled a group of experts that know that subject much better than anyone else. Now, that's been lost. Well, and well, I, uh, I think you could you argue, Bill, that that then it sort of speaks to that whole political piece of everything yep. and how it's yeah. just been infused into every branch, into into everything. I sound like a wild conspiracy theorist here, but um, mm. gosh, look at this, you know. Anyway, go ahead, Joe. Well, Sorry. What, what motivated uh, the, the – uh the case uh, at Loper Bright versus Raimondo, uh, Gina Raimondo, who's the uh, Secretary of Commerce. Uh, what motivated that case was fishermen up in the Northeast, in the Atlantic, uh, they had to have monitors on their boats when they went out fishing for certain kinds of, for certain species of fish. And the fishermen were forced to pay for those monitors, those, those federal regulators, if you will, on their boats. Now, the regulators were there to make sure that uh, certain species of fish weren't being overfished, which, you know, we all have an interest in that, I would think. Uh, but yet the surcharge uh, that the fishermen had to pay for having those monitors on their boats was 20% of their, of their revenue. 
And so the fishermen, you know, that, that's where the dispute originated, was they don't want to have to pay that. And uh, then it, that case eventually morphed into uh, a, a real, I guess, review of the regulatory scheme as a whole in this country. And, and that's uh, how the Chevron Doctrine came to be the, the central focus of the case. Uh, there's a lot of folks who I'm sure are really disabused with the notion that the federal government can come in regulate you and charge you for those services. Uh, but uh, And there's been, I'm sure, many examples of, of government overreach. Uh, in fact, uh, when you have Patrick Morrissey on, he'll, he'll, he'll cite you chapter and verse about that. But bottom line is, uh, I, I thought it still was a scheme that was workable. Uh, maybe Congress needed to go in and, and fix things and make sure that government agencies weren't running amok. But to just throw the baby out with, with the bathwater and say, uh, you know, now we're going to let the courts and Congress really uh, decide what what ambiguous regulations mean and fill in the gaps where Congress has not spoken to uh, certain regulations uh, seems to be a, uh, an overreach to the other extreme. I was having this discussion with my wife who works for the FDA, and there was an article that was released yesterday uh, that I was reading that talked about the effects down the line with prescription drugs and such with the Chevron doctrine. And the FDA is a prime example of you've got doctors and, and scientists who work on what the regulations are and they go through their system in terms of getting those regulations implemented. And you can throw a lot of those out the door now because this can negate a lot of that. And it talked about how uh, right now it's, it's, it's a fairly universal uh, regulation in regards to medicines and prescription drugs across the country. But all of that can now become on a state-by-state -state basis in terms of what drugs are approved for what use in which particular states, which is something we really haven't dealt with previously uh, in our lifetimes. Now, I think we probably, in, you know, go back 150 years, that's probably the case. But it changes the way, uh, when you think about this, you think about, okay, well, we're sticking it to the EPA. Yeah, all right, way to go. We stuck it to the EPA. But this isn't just about the EPA. It's everybody. This is about everything. And and the example my wife gave me yesterday or the day before was that there are certain drugs that are approved for adults, but over time you find out that they can actually be used for children. But if the drug is specific to adults, the overturning of Chevron could remove that use of the medication for children. And then it has to go back to Congress to tighten the law, the rule, the, 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 rem the remedy, whatever, in terms of how that use can be played out. And it, if you think about how dysfunctional Congress is right now, to try to get anything done, to get two parties to agree to pass anything right now, think about the impossibility of that if you're trying to do something on a, a very quick turnaround, like getting medication to a child who needs it. Yeah. Joe used the example of a fishing in the Northeast. There's a lot more to that story. When the Magnuson Act was repealed, uh, it kicked out all the foreign fishermen. The Portuguese had been fishing for dogfish, which also fed up on flounder. The flounder industry, the bottom fishing industry, was about to collapse in the U.S. To protect the bottom fishing, to protect the flounders, they had to put quotas on that was going to be collected. The fishermen were ignoring the quotas, and the National Marine Fisheries Service had one of two options. They could hire other people to go out and monitor every vessel, or they could put cameras on it. Now, the big difference is who paid for the cameras. That's where you may want to uh, say the overreach. But the overreach was there to protect the fishing, which now is a healthy fishing in the Northeast. It would not have been without this the uh, provisions that have put, been put in place. Yeah, and uh, Joe, well, go ahead, Joe. Yeah, I was just going to say, that, that, that comes down to the age-old question, Bill, of, of how do you look at regulations? Is it to impose uh, rules of conduct, or is it designed to curb conduct that is detrimental to the general welfare of, of society? And I would dare say that probably a majority of the regulations are really to curb bad conduct and bad actors who would overfish or who would pollute or who would who would attack on surcharges to your phone bill. I mean, these are things that regulations deal with, and, and oftentimes it, they're designed to, 
to stop bad actors from from really imposing burdens on all of us. Joe, let's move on to the immunity decision that the Supreme Court made and, and talk specifically about that. So when this, when it was first released, it was released as Trump won. He's got complete and total immunity. As you later read on that, it was four official acts. And then it became the we need to define what is an official act versus what's an unofficial act, Joe. Yeah. And, and what the court has essentially set up with regard to acts of the president, the, the U.S. Supreme Court has essentially set up a review process by which district courts are now going to be required to conduct extensive hearings with the prosecuting attorney required to put on basically all the evidence they have at this preliminary hearing to determine what acts can be de- declared official and what are unofficial. And that will always be subject to review. So up the chain you go through the uh, U.S. Courts of Appeals and then to the Supreme Court, who will then be the final arbiter as to what acts the president could potentially be held criminally liable for and what are some of those core functions that the president is absolutely immune from. So in every instance where there is going to be questions about criminality uh, arising in the Oval Office, there's going to be this extensive review that takes place. And, uh, you know, some people can say, well, that's appropriate because we don't want presidents to be constantly under the thumb of prosecutors in terms of Monday morning quarterbacking their actions while they served as president. That, that's, that's a fair argument. However, <laughs> I would ask people to cite me instances where that has become an issue in the past. In fact, there, 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 what has really been followed is, is uh, subsequent presidents refusing to look back and prosecute former presidents. We know President Obama did that when there was a hue and cry to prosecute George Bush over the uh, Iraq war. That's right. Uh, we know that President Ford pardoned President Nixon rather than than have a, a, a messy trial and, and declaring that our long national nightmare is over. So that's pretty much how we've conducted ourselves in the past. But now the Supreme Court has said, well, you know, we're not going to rely on that. We, we think it's appropriate to grant immunity for a wide array of conduct that the president can declare uh, he was acting officially or she was acting officially on, and and that will be untouchable. And the most important thing here... 15 seconds, Joe, 15 seconds. Uh, yeah, the most important thing from a prosecutor standpoint is that... You can't even look at acts of the president that might be official capacity as evidence of intent to commit a crime. Even that now is inadmissible in a court and inadmissible in a review of those actions. And, and that, to me, is the most damning part of this uh, Trump versus U.S. decision. Joe, thank you. As always, pleasure speaking with you, sir. Okay. Have a great show, guys.